and welcome to this Global Order webinar uh, titled Rebuilding Trust in the Indo-Naga Peace Process. It's a pleasure to be here today and to be chairing this webinar in which we will discuss the breakdown in trust in the Indo-Naga peace process and discuss possible ways ahead. I'm delighted to be joined by three distinguished experts with deep experience um, of actively grappling with questions of peace and conflict in the region. To introduce each of them um, very briefly, Mr. Gopal K. Pillay is a former member of the Indian Administrative Service of the 1972 batch Kerala Kader. He rose to hold one of the most important positions in the government of India, the post of Union Home Secretary. He also served as the Joint Secretary Northeast within the Ministry of Home Affairs and has held another, a number of other important positions within the government of India. His knowledge of Northeast matters is extensive based on decades of working in the region and engaging with stakeholders. Lieutenant General Dr. Konsum Himale Singh is an Indian Army veteran and the first Lieutenant General from Northeast India. He was awarded the Yud Siva Medal for his distinguished service in the Kargil War and served as Division and Corps Commander in Jammu and Kashmir and the Line of Control. After an almost 40 year career in the armed forces, General Dr. Himalay Singh then became chairman of the Manipur Public Service Commission. And he's presently a member of the consultative group of the state government on the Naga peace talks. He's recently published his memoirs titled Making of a General a Himalayan Echo. Lastly, Mr. Jaideep Saikya is a terrorism and conflict analyst and author of several books on security and strategy in the Northeast, including Frontier in Flames, among many others. He's currently a fellow of the Irregular Warfare Initiative, which is an initiative to connect scholars and practitioners at the Modern War Institute, the US Acad uh, Military Academy at West Point. As well as being an established scholar on the Northeast um, Indian region. He's also advised both the Assam state government and the government of India on a number of matters. So it's great to see you all today and thank you for joining us. To briefly introduce myself, I'm Dr. Alex Waterman. I'm a research fellow at the German Institute for Global and Area Studies in Hamburg and a visiting fellow at the University of Leeds, UK. My interest in the Naga political issue began in 2013 during postgraduate study. I studied the Naga conflict at length during my doctoral degree. I traveled to India, um, hosted with the Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis in New Delhi and the Tartar Institute for Social Sciences in Assam. Since I've written and spoken about the Naga conflict at a range of policy and defense think tanks, including the International Institute of Strategic Studies in London, and the Modern War Institute at the US Military Academy, West Point. We convened this webinar uh, fairly spontaneously and organically. Today, our objective is to build on and advance a conversation that two of our participants here today really started in the form of an article. So this article was published by Mr. G.K. Pillay and Mr. Jaidi Saikia in Northeast Now, um, and to which we will ensure a link is posted. Now, this article laid bare and articulated very clearly what many of us who watched the Naga peace process have been thinking about over the previous two years, that all was not well in the talks. Yet we only have to go back seven years to 2015, and the mood of the hour then was one of momentous optimism. The framework agreement had been signed between the government of India and the National Socialist Council of Nagalim, Isaac Moiva, to lay the foundations for thrashing out a final peace accord. The agreement had been signed during a time of high trust between the parties. The NSC and IAM's chairman, Isaac Chisi Swu, was critically ill. Being the senior most member of the group from the Sumi Naga community, the NSC and IAM wanted to ensure his signature on the document to ensure its, its claim to speak to a pan-Naga identity and ward off criticisms from its detractors 
that the group reflected the parochial interests of, of the Tankul Naga community. In this environment of high trust, the framework agreement was signed and optimism prevailed. And this optimism continued in the public discourse for several years. Um, you know, we're all familiar with the, the updates in the, in the news media that, that a final peace accord was um, simply just around the corner, that everything substantive was pretty much done and dusted, um, and that there were just a, a few matters of minor, even symbolic issues that needed to be simply ironed out. However, as the article suggests, this optimism eroded over time. Delays were becoming apparent by 2018, to be sure, and it became increasingly clear that the issue of granting a separate flag and constitution were key demands on which the central government could not um, kind of move on. And Pile and Psyche's article highlight two key events that really trigger the erosion of trust. The first was the abrogation of Article 317, Jammu and Kashmir, which created a fear in Nagaland that even if a constitutional amendment such as Nagaland's very own uh, constitutional provisions, Article 371A, if that was either strengthened or bolstered in a peace accord, then there was still a risk that domestic politics may lead to it being revoked at a later stage. The second was the appointment of Mr. Aaron Ravi as governor of Nagaland in 2019. Now, Mr. Ravi had, of course, been appointed the interlocutor for the peace talks in 2014, and at the time, he was, his appointment was very well received. He was one of a minority of officials who had pointed out that withdrawing the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, for example, would be a positive step. Yet juggling the dual hats of governor duties and interlocutor duties were ultimately at odds with one another and ultimately one undermined the, un uh, the other with Ravi's pressure on NSC and IM extortion activities really affecting his ability to drive forward the peace process. So the peace talks subsequently break down in 2020. And Ravi was, was subsequently replaced in the autumn of 2021 both as interlocutor and also as governor. Now in this piece, Pillay and Saikia are absolutely right when they warn that repairing trust and rebuilding the relationship um, will be a longer term process. Bringing in a new interlocutor, um, clearly an important step, it isn't an automatic fix. As we saw in October, for example, the NSC and I am expressed its disappointment with the first round of post Ravi talks with, with the new interlocutor. It again, pressed the flag and constitution demands and said that the talks failed to live up to the high quote. So it will take time and some sensitivity. Now, the article penned by our two, two of our discussants here today essentially started a conversation amongst ourselves. And our objective today is to, to, to continue that conversation and think about possible approaches the government of India might adopt for rebuilding trust with the Naga armed groups. We're all scholars and practitioners who've engaged with the region um, and have engaged with local stakeholders um, in various forms. And we're thus all keen on seeing peace emerge in the region. I'd just like to quickly draw attention before we start to my background. Um, so this, this colourful background behind me, um, Dr. Akup Buchem, who's exquisite artwork, uh, the shawls of 17 Naga tribes are seen tied together as one. Titled Together, this, this artwork, I think, portrays the essence of our enterprise this evening, um, while, I, while also um, drawing attention to the fact that many conversations beyond our own also need to be had. So myself, the participants and Global Order uh, humbly acknowledge this work um, and we see this artwork by Professor Akub as a symbol for a peaceful Nagaland, which is something, of course, that we all want to see. So the discussion will be structured as followed. Um, so I have prepared specific questions for specific members of our panel today in mind. Now, if it's possible to keep responses to within three minutes, then that will be hugely valuable for the purpose of timekeeping. So to start then, I'd like to 
really try to uh, dissect and, and distill some lessons learned from the past few years, um, the, the negotiations in the Ravi era. Mr. Pillay, I'd like to ask you, given your extensive experience in negotiations with the Naga armed groups and your reading of the past few years, what key lessons can be distilled from the Ravi era of dialogue with the NSC and IM? Yeah, thank, thank you, Alex. I think uh, real uh, two or three lessons that we learned. One is uh, keep negotiations and negotiators low key and off the front pages of newspapers. Uh, that's a very key uh, lesson. Second, uh, don't mix up the interlocutor's focus by giving him additional responsibilities which could lead to a conflict of interest in his duties. And I think third, uh, I think it was one of the most important uh, factors so that once you had a framework agreement uh, concluded in 2015, with all the hype that it had with the Prime Minister, the Home Minister, um, Moiva, and all the leaders all on one stage, platform at the, national, at the Prime Minister's house. Uh, you needed to quickly build on that and, you know, literally within the next three, six months or a year, conclude the peace process. Uh, having generated that hype uh, and then allowed it to drag on and on, uh, I think uh, created the initial bit of tensions that nothing was really uh, uh, going to happen. And this was just uh, another uh, delaying tactic, which was not going to go anywhere. Of course, we did have uh, certain other political development, which, uh, which you mentioned, uh, the abrogation of Article 370. And therefore, uh, there was also that little bit of lack of trust, which uh, was not shall I say, uh, taken into account while proceeding further with the negotiations on the Indonaga peace process and how you would make sure that uh, people who are, you are negotiating with uh, didn't have any misunderstanding on what uh, the government of India had done there and what they were, would do uh, in the Northeast in the peace agreements. I think that these were the three key uh, takeaways, I think, uh, from the Ravi era, which I can think of. Excellent. Yeah, thank you very much. Really, uh, really interesting points there. So yeah, um, keeping keeping negotiations somewhat low key and yeah, links nicely to your point about the, the hype following the framework agreement and yeah, the, the how this was allowed to kind of drag on. Yeah, I'd kind of add to that by thinking about the, um, the one of the lessons that I took was don't force the issue um, in using these kind of deadlines, which was, I think it was around 2019, in the autumn of 2019, where there was a, there was a final deadline imposed on the talks. And it, and it, it just from, from my reading of the situation in Nagaland, it was, it was seen as a, an attempt to really force the issue. And that I think seemed to further undermine and erode um, trust in the relationship. Um, the, your other point as well about not mixing up responsibilities, um, that, yeah, another one that I noted as well, um, putting an interlocutor in another publicly responsible role that pertains to Nagaland is probably something to avoid in the future. So yeah, completely agree with those points. Okay, so to, I'll move on to our next question then, having distilled a few lessons there. So, General Himali Singh, to what extent do you think that the uh, this immediate kind of fallout in the post-Ravi era, to what extent do you think that that presents a strategic opportunity from the perspective of the NSC and IM to hold out and and essentially press for further con concessions. Thank you, Alex. I also thank um, Zaydeep Saikya for giving me this opportunity uh, to be amongst the great, like Mr. Saikya, then Mr. Pillay, and of course you. Uh, whatever comments I may make uh, to begin with will be 
purely on my personal capacity, not uh, the view of the consultative group that uh, I also happen to be member of in this uh, Naga Peace Talks. Uh, having said that, I would say that uh, on the or from the perspective of NSCN, I am the, you know, it has got certain advantages, strategic advantages, the unstable neighborhood in Myanmar, and also possible, you know, renewed interest of the Chinese uh, belligerents in the possible uh, renewed Chinese, uh, and also the rise of Islamic uh, uh, terror in the Northeast India to some extent. All this combined gives the NSCNIM some kind of a strategic space. However, however, in the realm of this uh, peace talks uh, process, I uh, I'm of the opinion that whatever issues uh, are where to be discussed has been discussed in a very great detail. Uh, I was reading an article by uh, in the, in in our local paper where the chief minister and deputy chief minister of Nagaland. Uh, they are going to meet the union home minister in the next few days. This is what they said. And also ask for the quote unquote, there is the highest offer which you are going to give to this um, highest offer. You know, what is the ultimate? I mean, that is the kind of restlessness which is uh, coming up uh, even in the political circles. So that is a strategic advantage for NS and IM. On the other side, if you look at the game theory, you know, where, uh, where the threat of not reaching an agreement, you know, have, uh, I think NSC and IM has played out uh, significantly. The government of India has not yet played out as far as uh, this, you know, what is that uh, issue? So I think there is an opportunity for the NSC and IM a great opportunity uh, to really, you know, get on to the talks. But I'm also afraid of the stand that was taken by uh, Mr. Muiva in, uh, you know, last year in, in his talk, personal talk, I think, interview by Karan Thapur, uh, you know, 2021, where he said the breaking point is the constitution and the flag. We'll talk about it more as we progress. Thank you. Excellent, really interesting stuff. So yeah, a really interesting summary of the, um, some of the kind of conditions within which um, NSC and I may perceive some, some key opportunities, uh, opportunities for strategic leverage almost. So yeah, um, very rightly alluding to the unstable neighborhood, um, particularly, um, you know, developments in Myanmar over the past year um, and the implications that that's had for insurgency in the Northeast, something that we'll, we'll get to shortly. Um, the Chinese factor as well. Um, you know, we've had um, discussions about the, the, the role of the Chinese factor in insurgency in the Northeast. There's a long history there, um, but also, you know, um, rumblings of, of that being renewed. Also at the political level as well, um, very rightly kind of highlight how, yeah, that political pressure from, um, from for, for instance, you mentioned within the government of Nagaland, for example, um, again, presents opportunities um, at the level of negotiations as well. To move on then, and building on that idea of strategic opportunities, Mr. Jaideep Saiki, I'd like to ask you, so there's been there's long been an assumption that New Delhi is seeking to tire out insurgencies in the region by keeping them in what some have called a traffic jam of protracted peace talks. Um, and there's a belief with this assumption in mind um, that New Delhi is simply waiting for the, the leadership of of groups such as the NSC and I am um, to to ultimately be out of the picture um, and kind of using that to, to its advantage. Now, Jadi, you recently wrote an article on prolonged ceasefires and the peace talks. 
Um, so could you kind of enlighten us a, a little bit about that? And, and also, is this approach, from your perspective, an advisable one, this, this long-term protracted negotiations? Well, thank you, Alex. I think you pose two uh, questions, although they are related. But let me sort of uh, answer them one by one. The first thing is that there has been the popular perception in Northeast that uh, New Delhi has been trying to prolong the peace process in order to wear down uh, belligerent groups, uh, tire them out, as you say. And uh, it, at least in the case of the NSA and I am, it's gone on for almost a quarter of a century. And uh, although insurgency has, uh, has, has, has disappeared, in the classical sense of the word, in the sense that you know you don't have the classic insurgency where where they are engaging the Indian security forces or you know they are out in the jungles, etc. But the fact of the matter is, uh, if this perception were to be true that New Delhi is trying to tire out uh, the groups, then at least there is one silver lining, you know, Alex, and that is the fact that the peace dividend which uh, this, 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 this time span has actually uh, willingly allowed itself to play out has uh, worked to the sense that uh, I don't ever countenance that the insurgents who are now, after the ceasefire in 1997, the case of the NSA and IAM, would ever countenance going back to the jungles in any sense of the word. So, but there is a catch here, and uh, the fact of the matter is, insurgency may have disappeared, but this uh, prolongation of uh, you know the peace process has led insurgency, or whatever name, to graduate into something uh, almost by way of a law and order, as you alluded to uh, right in the beginning. I think uh, the NSC and I am example since we are talking about the Naga peace process has actually graduate, graduated into uh, you know, uh, aspects like extortion, taxation, uh, flouting of uh, you know, ceasefire provisions, uh, rules, and uh, even you know, arming and uh, training armed groups of the region. And this doesn't augur well, both for the ceasefire and for the region. So uh, I think, you know, uh, if New Delhi has that in mind and it does try to control uh, rebellion and unrest in the region by uh, resorting to a variety of means, uh, we call it the stratagem of uh, the Cortilian stratagem of Sam, Dam, Dernabed, reconciliation, cajolment, uh, punitive action, bribery, division, you know, or a combination of these four uh, stratagems. In fact, in the case of the Minnesota National Front, they uh, succeeded really. And today we have uh, Zoram Panga, the process lieutenant of Lal Dinga, as the chief minister of uh, Mizoram, swearing by the Indian constitution. But I don't think prolongation of ceasefire is, 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 a, is something which is recommended. And to your other question, which is very interesting, I don't think, and I think you're, uh, when you refer to the leadership of the INSNIM, I think you're referring to Mr. Buiba and his exit from the scene. Uh, I'm not sure whether the Indian agencies have done uh, direct profiling of the second rule of leadership here. I'm uh, referring to people like V.S. Hatem, Kunting, uh, I'm talking about Shantini Shimre, I'm talking about you know, uh, Lulangra. All these people, you see, they could well be more uh, belligerent, they could well be more, uh, you know, uh, uh, to use the word uh, rigid than Mr. Muiva. As a matter of fact, I think there are reports that talk about how Mr. Muiva have actually uh, uh, spoken to New Delhi and said that uh, if you do not give concessions, there would be hardliners within the NSA and I am who would actually uh, raise the uh, ante. So I don't know whether, if it is what to be true, what you say about the waiting period for Mr. Muiva's exit, whatever that means, uh, is a correct way. And we must not forget that in earlier years, uh, especially in 2010, 
13 years after the ceasefire with the NEC in 1997, uh, Anthony Shimre, who is a political commissar and a very important leader, was arrested for uh, procuring arms from a Chinese company and he was arrested in Kathmandu. So I don't think, you know, uh, we have to take into consideration that these are the uh, aspects which we have to look into when we talk about the peace process. And finally, I think it's important, why are we uh, talking about the exit of Mr. Guiva? I think he's ill and hearty, except the anecdotal references to his illness, and uh, he's uh, making his presence publicly in various uh, forums, and uh, the uh, action should be on trying uh, to resolve the problem uh, when uh, he's still the, uh, you know, General Secretary of the NSA and I. Absolutely, yeah. Really, really interesting points there, and I'd I'd completely agree. Um, as a as a as an external observer, um, kind of looking in, uh, one can see where the the process of drawing out peace talks has come from. Um, you know, if you go right back through the history of of India's efforts to manage insurgency in in the northeastern region. Um, the pace of granting major concessions to remedy insurgencies, remedy the grievances underlying insurgencies, um, such as granting statehood, granting forms of autonomy. Um, you know, this has had the consequence of uh, there's been new conflicts that have emerged during this process, new splinter factions, for example. Um, and this, this process has, has naturally slowed over time, particularly since the 1990s. And the number of different factions have, have proliferated and seemingly the strategy has changed towards managing this kind of ceasefire architecture. Now, more recently, the, the strategy has again changed and you can see this in the approach towards the Boro insurgencies, towards the, the Kabi Anglong insurgencies, in which it's more about bringing these clusters of armed groups together under one accord. Uh, which at least indicates that there's been a clear kind of lessons learned process here. Um, the challenge now, of course, and we'll talk about this a bit more later, is how to pull these disparate factions together, given that many of them have spent several decades fighting one another. You raised some really important points there as well, um, particularly about the, the uncertainty of, of a post Moiva NSC and I am. You know, the risks of of the leadership not being particularly disposed as Moiva was um, towards this kind of managing uh, the kind of peace process, uh, taking it in a certain direction. Um, so yeah, absolutely important to highlight that. Also, yeah, important points about the peace dividend as well. Uh, you know, this has now been, uh, we're now in entering the third decade of the, of the, the, the Indonaga ceasefire, the 1997 ceasefire. And clearly this will have an impact on, on return, the prospect of returning to the jungle. Um, you know, militants have, have you know, the, yes, they are based in, the, in designated camps, for example, some of the informal camps. They, you know, they do retain an operational presence. They go out on postings, for example, they're you know, quite operationally active against rival groups to a lesser extent, but still against Indian security forces at times as well. Been a number of clashes between NSC and IM and Assam Rifles Indian Army. But I do think, yeah, you, you do raise an absolutely good point that, that even though this is still the case, the, the extent to which they may... Um, they may make a full return to insurgency um, to the jungle is is lessening. However, that shouldn't yeah it shouldn't detract from the um, the way in which the government negotiates with the group. Okay, so let's move on to our next question then. So, Mr. Pile and General Himale Singh, what kinds of 
What kinds of confidence building measures might be available to the negotiators here then? And how might these kind of confidence building measures be employed to repair trust in the new rounds of negotiations? So perhaps we could start, uh, Mr. Pillay, with yourself, and then we'll move on to General Himali. Alex, I think the uh, first confidence building measure is, of course, the appointment of a new interlocutor, uh, which itself shows that uh, government realizes that, uh, shall I say, uh, there has been a lapse, and therefore they've taken the steps to correct that lapse, as you said, by uh, moving Mr. Ravi out and also uh, appointing a new uh, interlocutor. Uh, so uh, that's, in one sense, the first step government is acknowledging that uh, uh, there, is a, there is a point which the NSC and I have made. The other point which I think is, I don't think, I think the confidence building measures are, are going to take time to come and they're going to be take, uh, because, because uh, some of the fundamental uh, aspects are not going to go away uh, very clearly. You know, um, you've seen the abrogation of Article this, this thing. It's there. Uh, so uh, you you have this particular position where you have this, uh, uh, in one sense, a very muscular uh, central government, uh, which is very militarily uh, very you know strong, nationalistic uh, fervor. It's got a huge majority in parliament, over two thirds of the majority. So uh, it's not going to be easy to make any small concessions uh, come about uh, in a short period of time. The second is, I think, the most important thing for the interlocutor to do is actually to, if I may call it, uh, start reviewing the entire process of negotiations and to look at what are all the issues that have, where the issues are, shall I say, there's uh, similarity of views. And we've seen uh, the original 31-point uh, Charter of Demands with the NSC and IMG. Uh, we've gone through the entire list and quite a large number of them we've discussed and we've come to an agreement that this is the negotiated uh, end to the demand that has been there on each one of these demands. But there are also a few uh, set of issues like uh, uh, the extent of autonomy in the uh, Naga Hill districts of Manipur. Uh, there's the issue of the Pan Naga body, which was looking to the preservation of the Naga ethnic identity and culture. Uh, some of it needs to be fleshed out. Uh, and I think uh, uh, that is one area where uh, the two groups could meet and work their way forward. Uh, as I've always mentioned, the, uh, the issue of the flag in the constitution is something which uh, Mr. Muga has taken upon himself uh, to make that a sort of what we call as a breaking point issue. But we've seen that in all negotiations uh, when Mr. Laldenga was there uh, till the last minute he wanted a, a sovereignty. And then finally he did agree to a statehood uh, and came back. So he never took that demand for sovereignty off the table till the last minute. So these, these two demands could remain on the table uh, till you got a, a satisfactory solution on many of the other issues which I did mention uh, on which. And once that, those are satisfactorily resolved, then I think perhaps um, Muiva and the NSC and I will possibly feel that the, in the balance of things uh, with the mood of the uh, Naga people being for peace and a, and, a, and, a, and a sort of a solution uh, with honor and dignity, uh, it is something which they can then uh, accept and then move forward. But I, I don't think any, there's any short-term uh, uh, quick moves which will build confidence. This will have to take place over the next uh, couple of years. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. Really, yeah, really interesting um points there so yeah um one yeah of course recognizing the importance of appointing a new interlocutor as a confidence building measure unto itself it shows clearly that the government has 
has recognised that there is a problem and is taking steps to address that. Um, but and and yeah, also reviewing the process of negotiations. And yeah, thinking about the these other kind of questions around the degrees of autonomy and that some of that needs to be fleshed out. General Himali, could I ask for your thoughts on, on this question? Uh, Alex, um, in the confidence building measure, I would like to break it into two. One is the NSCN IM and other is the, uh, let's say, parties like NNPG and Naga Tribes Council. You know, the, there is a element to my understanding, a certain higher degree of confidence amongst the Naga Tribes Council, which is a very, very powerful council in Nagaland in particular, and also in NNPG, the confidence building measures are significantly high. That is my understanding. What is not uh, the confidence building appears to be low with the NSC and IM. So I'm trying to divide it into two. Uh, so uh, let me come down to NSC and IM. NSCN, I am, um, uh, as uh, you know, I think what is achievable and what is, um, you know, uh, 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 what is uh, equity in, in the entire ecosystem, uh, they also have to take that into consideration. What is achievable and what is equitable? Because in that uh, ecosystem in the Northeast region, uh, that ecosystem also have to be factored in mind. And also the reference point, reference point need not be 1956 or, you know, uh, you know, that 50 years back or 70 years back, things have changed, geopolitics have changed, the realities have changed. So this is something that, um, according to me, has to, as far as NSCNM is concerned, and as part of the confidence building measures, I think it is time uh, that both the negotiating uh, parties, uh, you know, they put things on the table, you know, uh, you know, clearly in a very, very uh, committed kind of a, you know, uh, uh, committed kind of a negotiation process, little more open because uh, this opaque thing has not worked out uh, for, uh, so far. So I think um, uh, the, you know, uh, the negotiations have to be uh, focused towards the, uh, you know, state of Manipur and to some extent, you know, Arunachal and uh, Assam, because that is where actually people are looking at uh, the ground, um, the feeling amongst the many, uh, you know, Nagas in Nagaland uh, appears to be a little more, quite subdued, except, you know, you see in uh, political, that is different issue, you know, quite subdued as opposed to what uh, NSC and IM leadership is. Uh, this. So the confidence mil building measures have to be focused towards, you know, the, I think, uh, more on non-territorial non issues. You know, because there are certain things called achievable, not achievable. Non-territorial issues have to be, you know, uh, part of the major confidence uh, building measures. Because finally, it is about uh, the identity issues now, which is being built up, being, you know, is becoming, you know, how many tribes are there, you know, very, very powerful tribes. So therefore, it has to be on the basis of non territorial issues, confidence building measures, that has to be focused. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, really, really interesting points there as well. Um, again, which I think I think resonates with um, some of what Mr. Pillay also mentioned in that, you know, we were talking about these, some of the more contentious issues, such as the flag and constitution, as the territorial aspect of the negotiations and how confidence building measures may be directed at some of the other aspects um, kind of prior to that, which may help to kind of build confidence momentum into, into the process. Yeah, really interesting stuff. Thank you very much. To move on then, to kind of reflect on recent events somewhat, I'd like to ask you, Jaideep Sankhya, to what extent is December's tragic incident in Mon District 
um, likely to have a bearing on efforts to revive trust in the process. How, if at all, can the specific impacts of this event on the peace process be mitigated? Um, and would, for example, the withdrawal of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, for instance, help to restore confidence? As I'm aware that that's, that's you know, this is currently an issue which is, which is, you know, it's um, it's being discussed at length within Nagaland, lots of protests, for example. So your thoughts on, on that, please? Very interesting question, Alex. But uh, the fortunate thing is that the unfortunate uh, incident of uh, 4th of December 2021 in Mohan district in Wuting has all been uh, almost been forgotten, uh, gratefully. And much of the credit actually uh, must be given to the Indian Army for having made amends for the mistake that they made. Uh, but this I misunderstood. I must underscore the fact that, uh, and I'm sure the Army and the government has uh, also made this very clear to the administration, including the Army, that standard operating procedures which were flouted during the uh, Mon incident has to be uh, more stringently uh, as yet too. Uh, and it is just a, a good fortune that, you know, it didn't sort of, you know, go beyond a particular point, you know, at this uh, juncture. But, uh, you know, uh, we have to be very careful about such uh, episodes in the future. And because uh, they have all the ingredients to uh, you know, uh, throw everything out of gear. And there are uh, spoilers aplenty, uh, agent saboteurs waiting for you know, uh, opportunity to derail a process like the Naga Peace process and sort of you know, uh, unhinge the entire you know, atmosphere. But fortunately, uh, this has not been so. But I don't think, I think. Uh, the, the, the cognac people and uh, because the long history of uh, camaraderie which I'm told by many people have actually gone into uh, their relationship with the Indian security forces particularly the Indian Army and the Assam Rifles in that particular area has uh, made uh, the population realize that this was an aberration not a rule and uh, so one has to really go on. But as far as the Armed Forces Special Powers Act is concerned, I personally am of the opinion that it should be withdrawn in a phased manner. For instance, it has been withdrawn from the Impal uh, municipal area, you know, uh, and as all is well. But the uh, fact of the matter is, uh, the Jeevan Reddy Commission has uh, submitted its uh, report. The government of India could take a call about withdrawing it from uh, areas where uh, there has been uh, decline in violence, decline in uh, incident action, because uh, I think this is a sore point with many people, you know, the fact that uh, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act continue to be enforced. But the most important thing here, Alex, I would like to point out is that, you know, uh, uh, you know, long years of deployment of the army it's not conducive for a number of reasons. A, because I think uh, it has taken the, you know, uh, edge of, you know, the, the, the cutting edge from the local police, you know, for instance. They tend to sort of look upon the army as the uh, sole uh, protector or, you know, guardian of the, you know, of the, of the, of the so-called insurgency affected states. And I think, uh, now the action should be uh, on training them, empowering them, and quickly passing on the baton to the local police and, if necessary, the uh, central paramilitary forces. And I think the army should return to its primary duty of guarding the borders, which, as you know, in the case of our northern borders, is not very uh, rosy. So I think uh, that's very important. I think uh, uh, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act uh, should be withdrawn in a phased manner, and uh, that would naturally endear it to the uh, population. In uh, if, 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 for instance, hot war, posture would be uh, 
uh, were to break out with uh, one of our neighbors, uh, we the army would need the population support in that sense, you know. So I think, you know, the army, which is trained for a particular duty of guarding the borders, um, do not necessarily need to be kept uh, longer than it is necessary for internal security management. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, completely, um, <clears throat> completely agree with your uh, thoughts. Um, I think the one of the things that I made a note of when I was thinking about this question was um, simply the low levels of conflict related fatalities in Nagaland itself. Um, it's been consistently below 10 um, since 2015. It's, you know, it's clearly that's not the only metric that we should be relying on. It's clearly, a, it's still a, a militarized environment, um, but you don't see the same levels of confrontation between the state and Nagas, even the ceasefire signatory armed groups compared to what you see in Manipur and Arunachal Pradesh. Um, now, one wonders then whether there's a case for selective strategic withdrawal from of AFSPA, at least from particular districts, so the likes of Mukokchung, for example, hasn't seen a conflict-related fatality since 2015, a number of others as well. And, and you, you also mentioned the Impal municipal area and the withdrawal of the act from there. Um, similar, similar kind of situations to Dimapur and Kohima. The, the, the key kind of security situation there is one of um, of extortion, uh, kind of policing, kind of issues. Something that Imphal has, you know, has continued to face, but but grapples with it largely through local security forces. So yeah, really interesting thoughts there. Now to move on to our final two questions, then. So and I'd like to address this to um, to all three of you, if that's all right. So we know that. One of the main issues in the talks with the NSC and IM has centred around the question of a separate flag and constitution. We've mentioned that briefly already in our in our conversation. Now it's been it's been public knowledge in the last um, few years that Delhi uh, cannot countenance such demands. The context of of what happened in Jammu Kashmir, for example. Yet in the past, seemingly intractable issues have been bargained down through workarounds, through compromises, through um, kind of symbolism. So take the idea of shared sovereignty, for example. It's quite a it's quite a vague concept that can mean a lot to different people, right? But that flexibility was, you know, it, it allowed for some degree of convergence to be created between the parties on that matter. Now, are there any workarounds, concessions or recognitions that might help to navigate around this flag constitution issue and restore confidence? So perhaps we could begin with Mr. Pillay and then we'll go to General Himale and then finish with Jai Deep. I think I've, I've briefly mentioned, Alex, that uh, the flag and the constitution issues are really something uh, which will come it's at the end, when you've got all the other issues uh, have been sorted out satisfactorily, uh, then I think it's a, it's a position. Uh, I personally have always felt that uh, the constitution, I think, is, is, is a no-no. It's not going to uh, be there. The question of a flag, uh, it's really neither here nor there. I mean, if, if that is the only breaking point, you can have always a flag because there are some any state governments in India which do have a flag, and it really doesn't make so long as you know it is clearly mentioned that you know it is subordinate to the national flag and state flag or whatever it is. So uh, uh, that is, uh, I don't uh, see that as uh, that as a major issue. I think the uh, one thing I think uh, in the framework agreement. I think the government uh, has, in one sense, conceded about the unique history of the Nagas and, uh, you know, the, the, what we have to look at it from, uh, from the point of view of the government of India. And this is where we've been, at least I've been at least very clear that 
we would like to find a solution. The government of India would like to find a solution. And at the uh, political level, even at the Cabinet Committee on Security, these demands have been, you know, they to and fro and demands and counter demands and revised demands and so on have been discussed at, at these highest uh, political levels and options and uh, alternate solutions have been put back and forth and solutions have been more or less found for a many, very large number of issues. Uh, but uh, in, for the government of India, one of the big issues, and this is where uh, I think the, the Naga society, Naga uh, has also to understand that when government of India looks at things, they also look at it from its implications on many other insurgencies and many other issues that are coming up. So you, if you give a concession here, then somebody else will say, give me that same concession. And then, you know, it's a, so you, you have to look at it. That and when you look, look at it really from the, in, from the population wise, uh, you know, it's the Nagaland population compared to the population of India, it's a very minuscule, you know, it's a 0. 0.004 or some percentage of the population, which is really, uh, you know, as far as the government of India is concerned, if you really wanted, you know, okay, we we willing to tolerate this level of this thing. The government of India can tolerate, you know, for another fifty years, for another hundred years, and by that time itself, the Naga society has changed uh, considerably over the last two generations of uh, uh, Nagas born in India. Have you know they have uh, uh, taken Indian citizenship. They have, many of them are working in different parts of India. Some of them are working abroad. So there is a, you know, the whole society itself has changed. And, you know, recently I was just seeing, uh, you know, the Naga women have not had much of a role because of their traditional society. But you are now looking at local bodies where you've got a central uh, legislation which says that one third of the seats in municipal corporations, and etc., should be reserved for women. So a big, uh, you know, a big agitation by the men uh, saying that, uh, you know, uh, that can't be allowed. But now the matter has come to the Supreme Court uh, uh, on the basis of uh, public interest litigation. And the government, the Supreme Court has really asked the government of Nagaland, you take a call. This is the law. So what's your call? And I expect that in the, in the next few weeks, most probably the government of Nagaland will say we are willing to allow because the assembly had once passed a resolution saying that we'll allow this reservation. Now, the moment you have uh, one-third reservation coming up in the political sphere in uh, Nagaland, I think uh, whole dynamics, uh, political dynamics start changing. Excellent. Really interesting points. Thank you very much. Yes. So, uh, yeah, really important points about the changing, uh, the changing nature of Naga society. Um, you know, many... Um, discuss the kind of impact of the ceasefire and how that's kind of opened up the space for increased civil society participation, for instance. Um, and that's something that we'll we'll get on to in a moment. We'll talk about this, this new kind of um, array of stakeholders. So, yeah, great stuff. General Himali, would you like to build on that? I'll take on from where Mr. Pillay uh whatever he has said, I would like to add uh, one or two points. First uh, issue is that, um, you know, Mr. Muiva draws the idea of flag and constitution from these two words called, quote, unquote, unique history and shared sovereignty. So these two, how is it interpreted is uh, what is important. Shared sovereignty, United Kingdom has got a shared, uh, shared sovereignty. Uh, United States of America is shared. It's like a federal kind of a setup. So that is how uh, the government of India uh, sees it. Whereas Mr. Muiva sees it that, uh, okay, shared sovereignty means they are two different entities, you know, totally sovereign entities. So, so that, that is where that, um, you know, if you recollect, there was an incident when Mr. one Mr. Abonmai, uh, you know, who, uh, who was assassinated for saying so, you know, that, you know, Mr. Uh, NSA and IM is saying about flag and const uh, constitution, unique history is that every human being is unique. This is what Mr. Abonmai said, who was assassinated last year. And also shared sovereignty is already shared, you know, between the state list and uh, 
centralist. So, in, in fact, for saying so, Mr. Abunmai uh, was assassinated. So, the point that uh, what uh, flag and the constitution, coming to this flag and the constitution, as Mr. I agree with Mr. Pillay that this is probably the last this thing, and the constitution, a separate constitution, which uh, will be uh, certainly a no-no from the you know, government of India. However, one could negotiate during the, uh, you know, things like Article 371A, a modified Article 371A, a modified sex schedule kind of uh, this could be, uh, you, call, you, uh, uh, you know, you call that as an appendix or whatever it is, you know, of the, or the name it as Article 371A modified, name it as, don't call it Naga. Uh, I'm for, um, no ethnic issues should be played up in uh, our constitution at all. However, certain uh, elements of, uh, you know, which says that for special in the case of, let's say, Nagaland or something, you name it within the constitution, just the nomenclature. I think NSNIM is looking for a, a way out. I mean, honorable, you know, honorable kind of a way out so that they don't lose face. I think finally, this is what the flag and constitution will boil down to. Uh, that is my view, uh, Mr. Alex. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, really interesting uh, points. Again, dr highlighting the links in particular between the flag and constitution issues to the interpretation of concepts such as shared sovereignty. And yeah, really reinforcing how, how the NSC and I interprets that and how that's important, that matters. Um, and yeah, some interesting thoughts as well about a modified Article 371A, a modified six schedule, for example. Mr. Saiki, would you like to add to that? Yes, as far as workarounds is concerned, Alex, I think uh, I'm also on the same page as uh, Mr. G.K. Pilla and um, Himale. But uh, I think uh, the magnanimity of the Indian state is enormous. And, uh, and uh, this particular peace process, the Naga peace process, which has gone on for a quarter of a century, as I said, uh, they would not exist without some concessions. So even as we uh, debate uh, on the separate flag and the constitution, and the second one being certainly a no-no, as both my uh, preceding speakers have said, I think, you know, one aspect that has to be taken into consideration, and I think I must place it on record, at least as my uh, uh, interpretation or my way of looking at things is that I think an opening has been arrived at uh, with the coming, the returning of the BJP uh, to Manipur in a big way, really. Uh, before the elections, there was this bill which was not tabled. I'm referring to the Manipur uh, Hill Areas uh, Autonomous Council 2021 bill, you know, which uh, talks about, you know, autonomy to the hill districts of Manipur, primarily to the Nagas and the Kukis. Now, um, with, uh, you know, and the politics of Manipur is such, according to my reading and observation, and also, um, you know, uh, discussion with very important scholars of Manipur tells me that Manipur, primarily Imphal, that is, uh, always sides with the ruling party in New Delhi. Now, that's a very unique thing as far as uh, the Northeast uh, polity is concerned. And to that end, I would say that this particular bill which I refer to, the Manipur Hill Areas uh, Autonomous Council 2021 bill, New Delhi can sort of use it as a leverage, as pressure, or uh, not pressure really, but by way of actually trying to sort of, you know, tell the, uh, tell Imphal that, you know, you ensure that this bill is passed. Of course, there's a caveat that, you know, the Valley people who are against this bill, uh, they don't want it even to be tabled. I think, you know, a task force needs to be formed to look into, uh, the bill closely and make uh, 
correct adjustments so as not to sort of, you know, uh, anger the valley people. Uh, a select committee of the assembly, whenever it is, uh, I think it's already on its way to be convened, uh, has to be constituted. And uh, a new look uh, bill can then be tabled, which Mr. Muiba should be told is all that you're going to get in JID Psychiatrist terminology. I would say it is autonomous plus. That's all you're going to get. Uh, yes, but we must be very clear about the fact that the valley people uh, should not be, you know, uh, should be assuaged. Their, their sentiments should be uh, taken into consideration. We don't want a repeat of 2001 when an absurd extension of uh, ceasefire of territory limits, you know, set the entire valley ablaze and the Manipur assembly burned down. We don't want that to happen. I think it's important that before the tabling of this bill with some people call it controversial, but I see opening here where Bulva could be told that this is all that you get. And because of this unique uh, relationship which Imphal enjoys with New Delhi, both of them are from the Bharatiya Janata Party, I think New Delhi could tell Imphal that uh, just with modifications which will not hurt the sentiments of the Valley Valley people, you can assure that uh, ensure that the bill is passed and uh, which will assuage the uh, the, the, the uh, sentiments of the NSA and leadership as well, you know. But the way the bill is today, I think it is almost tantamount to creating a different uh, state within a state. And that is perhaps not acceptable to uh, uh, the, 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 the Valley people. Um, uh, but I would say that since you already have a bill, a uh, little tinkering in, uh, with that, uh, first you have a task force look into it, have uh, people from various uh, walks of life, including the Valley people, the NSA and I am, the Royal Crabs, you know, people like Mr. G.K. Pillai and Lieutenant General Himala Singh, to form a task force, look into it, and actually place a modified bill in the, in the, in the, in the coming weeks, uh, and also inform Mr. Muiva that this is as far as what we can go to give you uh, what you uh, what you were talking about a separate uh, homeland or a greater Nagali, you know. And as far as separate flag is uh, concerned, I am totally on the same page as Mr. Pillai. You know, it's I mean there are there are clubs and you know uh, such other uh, you know organizations everywhere which have uh, has its own flag. And uh, I don't think you really will make much of a hullabaloo about that. The Constitution certainly no. I don't think uh, that is possible. But the important thing is for us to have a way or an opening by way of this Manipur Hill Areas uh, Autonomous Council 2021 bill, which is uh, will be tabled, I think, uh, as the assembly convenes. Excellent. Thank you very much. Really interesting points there about... And, and if I may, Alex, sure. I just also want to tell you, if I may add quickly, that uh, there is some reports on the ground which uh, uh, informs me that the Tangkuls of Manipur are not very acceptable to the, uh, 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 to, to the Nagas of present-day Nagaland, that they are talking about the territory of Nagaland as it uh, is today. And the uh, Tangkuls of, Nagal of Manipur have uh, begun to sell off their land in Dimapur and Kohima and are uh, purchasing instead uh, land in Imphal uh, with probably uh, uh, anticipation that, you know, the uh, extension of the homeland onto the hill districts of Manipur would never happen. But if that were to be so, and if the parish of Mr. Buiba constitutes these people, then uh, you really should read the signs, the read the entrails, and actually make sure that uh, this particular bill, which is, in my mind, uh, opening, would be uh, examined closely. Back to you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, really interesting insights there um, about the bill currently being tabled, um, the political implications of the recent election in Manipur, um, and, yeah, what that might possibly mean. So, yeah, it seems that, Clearly, it's important to bear in mind that India is a big country. 
uh, there have been multiple kind of autonomy movements um, over the years and that what is done in one piece process has a bearing on others. Um, you know, we, we've seen this from the implications from, from, from Kashmir on the Naga process, but you can also see it within the Northeast as well, um, within states such as Assam, where, where the granting of autonomy has led to another an autonomy movement. Um, so it's, it is really important to bear in mind that kind of wider process of, of signalling to other negotiating processes. It seems nonetheless that constitution, the idea of a separate constitution appears to be you know, quite a significant no-no, whereas a flag seems something um, in which more room for manoeuvre might be, might be arrived at. Now, what's been interesting in each of the um, responses there has been basically alluding to the, an array of wider actors. You know, this is not a bilateral process at all. Um, and I guess this this final question, which I'd like all three to uh, all three of you to to speak to, draws on Mr. Pillay and Mr. Psyche's article, which underlines the importance of bringing civil society in both Nagaland and in Manipur into confidence, and indeed the other states in which there are significant Naga populations. This is a multi-actor peace process. Um, you know, essentially, when you think about the armed groups themselves, it is essentially a two-track process at the moment, with one track being the state NSC and IM dialogue, and the second being the talks with the working committee, that much wider kind of array of um, smaller armed groups, is currently about seven within that working committee. And then also a, a much wider array of stakeholders across the various tribal representative bodies. And since the ceasefire, um, a, a growing array of civil society organisations, which have, which have really developed in their, in their confidence, uh, their ability, their political standing, their ability to influence uh, the situation on the ground as well. And at the same time, we need to take into account other stakeholders, such as non-Naga civil society across the region, um, who, for example, have long expressed fears that concessions around uh, autonomy would threaten local livelihoods, generate new inequalities. Now, the risk, of course, is that any steps, concessions, confidence-building measures to repair the state NSC and IM relationship could then have a bearing on some of those other relations with other armed groups and other actors in the region. So my question to all three of you um, is how can we ensure that any steps not to any steps to improve trust in the government of India, NSC and IM dialogue do not alienate or undermine these relationships with other critical stakeholders. So perhaps Mr. Pillay, we could start with you. Yeah, Alex, I think, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, for a long time, the focus has been on what we call as Naga civil society groups. Uh, you know, you've had the Naga Ho Ho, the Naga Students Federation, the Naga uh, various uh, Students Federation and so on. Uh, and we've really forgotten what we call as the non-Naga uh, civil society, society groups, which have actually uh, been, if I may put it this way, these this, that has been the primary opposition to uh, the stumbling block uh, to any deal. Uh, because they, they, they always felt that any concessions on the hill districts of Manipur uh, would only lead to the breakup of Manipur unless there are, shall I say, counter uh, concessions given by the people in the hill districts. And in the, in the valley, uh, especially the Maitis feel that uh, they have a huge population, but they have, you know, the area is, you know, uh, so small, 10% of the population, I mean, 10% of the area, and you got 60% of the 40, uh, 45, 50% of the population in that. And you have a land laws which says that uh, anybody in the, which is in the larger uh, area uh, with a low population can buy land in the valley, but people in the valley cannot buy land in the hill districts. 
So uh, uh, they feel this, this is historically uh, something which has uh, really affected their development and their, uh, you know, it's, they feel that is uh, something suffocating the valley. So uh, uh, I think when they look at terms of want, you want greater autonomy, you want greater, etc., like in the rest of India and so on, you should be able to be able to concede some element of what I call as concessions on the use of land. I mean, you may still keep the ownership of the land uh, with, it, with the Naga uh, tribes, but at least the use of the land uh, by the valley people uh, in the hill districts, uh, subject to uh, uh, certain restrictions, is going to be a very critical uh, uh, factor uh, when you are able to uh, uh, clinch this deal, if you want to, if you want to put it. Otherwise, uh, an autonomy which is, you know, uh, you want, which they will feel uh, that at autonomy uh, for the hill districts, which they feel will be a stepping stone, stepping stone to a creation of another state, uh, will actually get slightly reduced if there's a stake by the valley people in the hill districts also. And uh, that is going to be one of the critical factors, which uh, some discussions is taking place, but not uh, enough. Uh, there has been, uh, I think, the need to build a little bit more trust. Like we said, in the Naga peace process, you need to build greater trust between the hill pe valley people and the hill people also uh, is also equally important uh, in, in the coming years to come. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really important point. Um, and yeah, almost the kind of inseparability of of the the NSC and I am Government of India dialogue and the and the importance of rebuilding trust in that process, but then also within the within within Manipur itself, the you know, the long standing divide between um, hill and valley communities. Um, but also, yeah, to kind of add to that as well, you can also think about rebuilding trust and confidence building measures within the hills themselves between some of the um for example the naga and the cookie communities as well um so yeah really really important points there general himalay singh would you like to build on that uh yes uh, i agree with uh, uh, mr pele you know Insurgency has actually turned into some kind of a identity war or identity politics. That is the reality today. And amongst the tribal community, identity is defined by land, land issues. That is the crux of the this. And as you know, there are 36, you know, small tribal groups and ethnic groups in Manipur, since we are talking about Manipur. How do you actually, you know, um, have all these groups agreeing or have a common kind of a ground? That is the challenge. Having said that, I've interacted a number of civil society groups, both in the hills and um, in, the, in, in the valley. Everyone across the board are of the opinion that this peace accord must be the same for you know must be seen through in order you know to see some real development you know as far as land is concerned like mr pillar said some kind of a monetization of you know in areas where developments could take place you know such kind of a, uh, issues could be uh, attempted it has to be a comprehensive um, approach Otherwise, you deal with one and then, uh, you know, the other demand comes and then there are other m multiple stakeholders in this situation. It has to be a little more uh, a comprehensive issue because of the uh, diversity without playing up this ethnic divide at all, because that is a dangerous game. And uh, I will also uh, uh, suggest, like I agree with Mr. Saikia's um, suggestion, of you know, task force, that bill that you're talking, with a kind of a modified, uh, you know, a modified bill, uh, since he mentioned about that, is also a workable kind of thing, which is known to a lot of people, but in the present shape, it is uh, certainly not. 
Uh, and the task force comprising of uh, people, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Pillay and uh, I'll strongly recommend, you know, Saikya and all. Lastly, I would like to say that uh, in any talk, let it is important to uh, ensure that there is a closure of certain, you know, uh, not leaving things open-ended. Uh, for example, you know, like that territory issue, you know, right since 9-point agreement, 16 points, long accord, that uh, territory issue has been left open-ended. Once you leave an issue open-ended, then it gives hope for future, you know, uh, unrest or, you know, expectations. So otherwise, I think um, you know, overall, uh, the uh, last to say is that some give and take and uh, a little fresh approach to the issue, I'm sure this accord can be done if both parties are genuinely interested and generally this, I'm sure that the government of India is very keen. I'm aware of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really. Yeah. Really interesting points there. Um, yeah. One of the points that's really um, come up there um, in both the responses is the, the importance of the issue of land and its connection to identity. Yeah. Really, really important stuff. Also, yeah, thinking about, again, the number of stakeholders involved and the importance of a solution that is not only comprehensive and that clearly ties up some of these more open-ended issues, but also, you know, clearly clearly kind of addresses these, these kind of other issues, these other, um, these other conflicts, these other tensions, because, you know, this is, again, it's clearly, it's not, a bilateral process is 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 very much kind of multilateral with different stakeholders. Jaradeep Saiki, would you like to uh, would you like to add to that? Very briefly, I think uh, I agree with both Mr. Pille and uh, Jalhi Male when I say that the uh, dissonance in the Hill Valley, at least as far as Manipur is concerned, has to be corrected. I mean that's something which is not acceptable to even people who are outside Manipur. But having said that, uh, I would still say that the, uh, the, the my last answer uh, by way of the bill, I think the autonomy plus, as I would sort of, you know, characterize it, is something which we should uh, examine closely. I'm uh, happy that General uh, Himale has uh, talked about the task force, which perhaps could be even headed by Mr. Pele, really. And he has the Probably taken his name off the task well, I think he's the correct person, uh, being a man of both uh, experience and uh, you know uh, long years in the army and also in uh, Manipur civil society. But as far as see the stakeholders is concerned, I think the most important aspect is I think transparency, and I am and with that because I think uh, although. I was uh, of the idea that most peace processes, the moment it becomes public, actually attracts spoiling, uh, uh, you know, objective. Uh, the spoilers are plenty tough to sort of derail the process. But uh, that's not really the case with the NSC and I peace process any longer. After all, you just traversed uh, uh, 25 years. I think now, uh, with the fresh uh, interlocutor and the new interlocutor and the fresh talks, Starting, I think, you know, every bit of it should be uh, visible, uh, discernible to the stakeholders, which includes the civil societies of Nagaland, Manipur, and, you know, the other concerned states, but primarily these two states. And I think that should be the watchword, really, transparency, because you saw what happened with the framework agreement. It failed because it was a riddle wrapped up in an enigma and the secrecy was shrouded in, really. And uh, as we all agreed, it had uh, the makings of, uh, of a solution. If only there was a little bit of openness and uh, transparency there. So I think uh, from now on, I think uh, the people of Nagaland and Manipur, which are important stakeholders in this particular process, have to be kept informed about the progress of the talks, so that if there is a little bit of a bump, these uh, small bumps can immediately be taken care of before they sort of, you know, become uh, huge and, you know, unmanageable later on. 
So I think transparency, uh, keeping the stakeholders informed and uh, being very, very uh, upfront about the autonomy plus, which I'm talking about, which I spoke about, is uh, should be the uh, way forward in rebuilding trust in the Indonaga peace process. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think that's a great point on which we can uh, begin to conclude. So, yeah, thinking about issues like tra yeah transparency very clearly, um, you know, the the issues with the framework agreement, the kind of shrouded in secrecy aspect. Um, so not only being transparent, but also not being kind of carried away by the hype to kind of go back to the beginning, uh, the discussion that we had at the beginning as well. So in sum then, we started by essentially addressing what the situation was, what some of the key kind of lessons were from the from the years with Aaron Ravi as negotiator. We discussed issues such as keeping the negotiations, um, you know, somewhat low key, um, albeit as as Jadip Saiki just mentioned, you know, with that that important transparency as well to to kind of bring in the other stakeholders into confidence. Other lessons as well included um, ensuring that an interlocutor um, is not kind of taking on different hats, uh, which will you know create problems further down the line. We then went on to discuss the extent to which there were strategic opportunities, whether it be that on the side of the NSC and IM to kind of press home for concessions, or on the other hand, for the government of India to, to kind of use its own kind of strategic opportunities for long-term tiring out of insurgencies. We discussed how that might, you know, create clear problems despite the peace dividend that has been arrived at. We then went on to discuss some um, confidence building measures that, that might have and indeed already have been adopted. So we talked about the appointment of a new interlocutor and how that in, in many ways is that, you know, it, it's, it's a key kind of first step in, on that, that journey to rebuilding confidence. We stress the importance that this will take time though. Uh, that we can't just have this kind of magic laundry list of, of confidence building measures that will all of a sudden uh, transform the relationship overnight, right? We then went on to discuss the question of the incident in Mon District in December and the implications of that. Um, the question about the possible withdrawal of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act and the extent to which uh, that such a withdrawal, uh, even in a phased or perhaps district specific manner, may have some, you know, it may it may serve to build confidence, perhaps. We kind of discussed that as a possible issue. We then moved on onto the issue of the flag and constitution. And any kind of workarounds, et cetera, that exist. We discussed generally around that the, the, the idea of a constitution is generally, it's not, it's not going to happen, albeit that there may be some workability around, around the issue of a flag, but the attention should generally be paid to some of these other arrangements, um, such as the autonomy plus that was, that was discussed um, across several of the questions as well. And then we talked about the range of stakeholders um, involved in the process and the, important to, the, the importance of keeping those um, in confidence about addressing, for example, some of the structural imbalances um, within, we talked about, for example, Manipur, but also thinking about within, within the Naga civil society, its relationship to the armed groups, to the relationship between the two kind of separate tracks within the peace process as well, between the working committee and the NSC and IM as well. So some very interesting insights overall. And I'd like to thank you very much um, all for your, for your insights today. I'd like to thank Global Order for hosting this webinar. And I'd like to thank everyone who has listened to this conversation as well. So... Thank you all very much. We'll close at that. 
Thank you. Thank you. And take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.